Hey everyone! Today we're diving deep into one of the most widely used machines in the world, the induction motor, also known as the asynchronous motor. This machine is all around us, quietly powering so many aspects of our daily lives. But how exactly does it work? If you enjoy the content, please don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell so you never miss any update. Well, in simple terms, an induction motor is an AC electrical machine where the rotor generates torque through electromagnetic induction from the rotating magnetic field of the stator winding. Let's break that down a bit. An induction motor consists of two main components, the stator and the rotor. The stator is the stationary part, and its role is to create a rotating magnetic field. The rotor, which is housed inside the stator, interacts with the rotating magnetic field and generates the mechanical force needed to spin. Unlike a synchronous motor, which we covered in a previous video, the rotor of an induction motor doesn't rotate at exactly the same speed as the stator's magnetic field. This slight difference in speed is why it's called an asynchronous motor. The rotor speed is always a little slower than the synchronous speed of the stator's rotating magnetic field. This difference is key for the induction motor to keep rotating properly. We'll explain the reason in just a moment. Now, you might be wondering, how do we calculate the synchronous speed of the stator's rotating magnetic field? Well, there's a simple formula to calculate this. It depends on two factors, the frequency of the power supply and the number of poles per phase in the stator winding. For instance, if we have a 50 Hz three-phase induction motor stator with six poles in total, then the pole per phase will be 2, and the synchronous speed can be calculated as 3000 RPM. But here's something cool. There's no physical connection between the stator and the rotor. There's an air gap in between them. So, how does the stator make the rotor spin? The magic happens when you connect the AC power to the stator. The alternating current causes the stator to generate a rotating magnetic flux that sweeps across the rotor windings. These rotor windings are short-circuited, allowing the magnetic flux to induce a current in them, thanks to Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Here's where things get even more interesting. Once this current is induced in the short-circuited windings, the rotor generates its own magnetic field. And according to Lenz's law, this induced magnetic field opposes the change in the applied magnetic field. Just like when you move the north pole of a magnet toward or away from the coil of wire. The current induced in the coil creates a magnetic field that opposes that motion, and you may experience a repulsive and attractive force, respectively. This opposing force between stator's rotating magnetic field and the rotor's induced magnetic field is what creates the torque that spins the rotor. But here's an important point. For this torque to happen, the rotor must always turn slower than the stator's rotating magnetic field. If the rotor matched the synchronous speed, there would be no relative motion between the stator's rotating magnetic field and the rotor windings, meaning no induction and, therefore, no torque. The difference between the rotor speed and the synchronous speed is called slip, and it's crucial for the induction process. To truly understand the behavior of an induction motor, we often look at its equivalent circuit. This model represents only one of the phases and allows us to analyze the motor's performance in detail. In fact, the induction motor is equivalent to a rotating transformer because both devices operate based on the principle of electromagnetic induction. That's why equivalent circuit of an induction motor is similar to a transformer's. In the equivalent circuit, we have components like R1 and X1, representing the stator's winding resistance and leakage reactants. The resistance R0 accounts for the no-load core losses, while X0 represents the magnetizing component of the no-load current. The rotor side also has its own resistance R2 and reactants SX2 in the running condition. The SE2 represents the rotor's induced EMF under running conditions. You might notice one thing that's different from a typical transformer equivalent circuit. Yes, it is the presence of slip, which impacts both the induced EMF and the rotor's reactants. This is because, unlike in a stationary transformer, the rotor in an induction motor is rotating, meaning the frequency of the rotor's induced EMF differs from that of the stator supply due to the slip. Let's break it down with an example. 
When the motor is first turned on, the rotor isn't moving yet, so the slip is at 1. At this point, the induced EMF and leakage reactants in the rotor are at their peak because the relative motion between the stator's rotating magnetic field and the stationary rotor is the greatest. This is also why the starting current in an induction motor is much higher than during normal operation, due to the high induced EMF at startup. Moreover, the motor starting power factor is very low because of the high rotor reactance in the initial stages. As the rotor accelerates and approaches its operating speed, the slip decreases, along with the induced EMF and rotor reactance. This results in a decrease in current and an increase in power factor. However, if the rotor were to reach the synchronous speed, the slip would drop to zero, meaning no relative motions, zero induced EMF in the rotor. In practice, the rotor's electrical parameters can be transferred to the stator side to simplify the calculations. By analyzing this equivalent circuit, we can gain valuable insights into the motor's overall performance, including stator and rotor losses, core losses, and efficiency. Now, let's talk about the torque speed characteristic curve of the motor. Initially, the very first point when the motor starts to turn is known as the starting torque, or locked rotor torque. This represents the maximum torque the motor can produce when the rotor is at rest or zero speed. As long as the load on the motor is less than or equal to this starting torque, the motor will successfully start. However, if the load exceeds this torque, the motor will fail to start. Next, as the motor accelerates, there is a temporary dip in the available torque, and the lowest point during this acceleration phase is known as the pull-up torque. Following this, the motor reaches its breakdown torque, which is the maximum torque it can deliver before it stalls. This breakdown torque represents the motor's peak capability to handle overloads without failing. Lastly, as you might have guessed, at synchronous speed, the torque is zero. Induction motors typically operate in the stable region of the torque speed curve, which is located to the right. In this region, as the required torque increases, the motor speed will gradually decrease, maintaining stable and efficient operation under varying loads. Now, how can we control the speed of an induction motor? When it comes to speed control, induction motors offer several methods. In earlier days, adding resistance to the rotor circuit was a common technique to reduce the rotating speed of motor. However, with the advancements in power electronics, variable frequency drives, or in short VFDs, have become the promising solution in many modern motor applications. By adjusting the frequency of the power supply, VFDs can achieve precise speed control, making the process more efficient and accurate. The reliable speed regulation of VFDs is crucial in a wide range of industrial and commercial applications. Lastly, let's touch on the difference between single-phase and three-phase induction motors. One key distinction is that single-phase induction motors are not self-starting. They often require capacitors to create a phase shift, effectively generating a two-phase supply. This phase shift is crucial for producing a rotating magnetic field, allowing the rotor to begin turning. In contrast, three-phase induction motors are self-starting. The phase difference between the stator windings naturally creates a rotating magnetic field, eliminating the need for additional components to initiate rotor movement. To wrap things up, induction motors are truly a technological marvel, found in everything from household appliances like refrigerators, washing machines and ceiling fans, to industrial machinery such as pumps and compressors. They're also used in electric vehicles and many others. Their reliability, efficiency, and widespread use make them an essential part of modern technology. That's it for today's video. I hope this gives you a clearer understanding of how induction motors work, their characteristics, and their applications. If you find this video helpful, please remember to like, subscribe, turn on the notifications, and share it with others. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.